and sand raw materials from Lebanon. Um, since the topics that are being presented in this session cover a wide range of materials and uh, techniques, I'm going to start my presentation with a um, bit broader introduction than I normally would because I expect not all of you are that familiar with glass artifacts. Um, nowadays, we see glass everywhere. It is used for a wide variety of applications and produced on an industrial scale. But actually, the overall composition of glass hasn't changed much since it was first produced in the 3rd millennium BC. Over the course of history, there have been quite a number of different ways to make glass. And I'm going to talk about one type in particular, and that's natron glass. Natron glass was the most commonly used glass type between the middle of the 1st millennium BC and the 9th century AD. And it was essentially produced as a mixture of three components. Uh, quartz sand, which was fluxed with a soda-rich mineral matter called natron, and stabilized with lime. The natron was derived from evaporitic lake deposits, rich in sodium carbonates with minus sulfates and chlorides. It most probably came from Egypt, but other possible sources have been suggested. The major source of lime would have been calcium carbonate, which was either added deliberately to the glass batch as a separate component, or accidentally as pieces of shell or limestone in the sand used as a source of silica. The silica sand was a major component of the glass, and glass factories were therefore most likely built in the vicinity of suitable sand sources, since the transportation of vast quantities of sand would have been quite costly. Um, sometimes also small amounts of other minerals and metals were added to the glass to give it a specific color. From archaeological data, um, it seems to be that during the Byzantine and Islamic, early Islamic period, Natron glass production, so production from its raw materials, was exclusively being done in restricted areas in uh, Israel and Egypt. For the earlier Hellenistic and Roman periods, the story is less clear. Um, on the basis of analytical data and um, based on written references from ancient authors such as uh, Pliny the Elder and Strabo, it appears to be that glass production did occur in the same general ge geographical area in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also in other parts of the Western part of the Mediterranean basin. However, um, no primary production sites of that period, so Hellenistic and Roman, have been discovered, so the actual production sites are not known yet. Provenance in natron glass is not easy. Um, because during the production of natron glass, the melting of the sand, a lot of the characteristics of the sand raw materials, such as light and heavy mineralogy, grain size and shape, are lost, so that only bulk chemical data can be used to differentiate between possible sources. Several major composition groups have been identified in literature, uh, mostly based on concentrations of elements such as uh, calcium, aluminium, but also iron and magnesium, because these elements can be related back to specific minerals in the sand raw material. Um, some of these groups, such as the uh, bet Eliezer group, can be traced back to particular uh, production sites in Israel and some in Egypt, but for others, such as the uh, Roman blue-green group and the Roman uh, antimony decolorizer, uh, we have no idea where they were produced. So to gain some more insights into the uh, organization of the Roman glass industry, we analyzed some uh, late Hellenistic to early Roman glass artifacts from Beirut. We selected 66 glass fragments from cast glass bowls, such as these, um, which corresponded to seven different typological groups, which I won't discuss today. And among these samples were 18 colorless glasses, 12 were uh, deep yellow or amber, 
uh, a few olive green, deep blue, and purple, and the remaining 30 samples were pale colored with light tints of green or blue. Um, and we might consider these as naturally colored. Most Roman glasses had a slight bluish green tint, and this was because there are iron impurities in the sand, and these give this uh, light greenish or bluish tint to the glass. We analyzed all these samples uh, with electron microprobe, so we determined the major elemental compositions, and it, our results indicate that the um, vibrant colors were achieved by adding specific elements such as copper and cobalt to the glass, or by uh, very carefully controlling the furnace conditions, so reducing or oxidizing atmospheres. Uh, all very interesting stuff, but I don't have time to discuss that today. Uh, I will talk, however, very shortly about the colorless glass, because we're going to need that a bit later. Um, as I said, most natural colored glasses are slightly green or blue due to the iron, but uh, the Romans, uh, other ancient glassmakers, could solve this by adding small amounts of magnesium or antimony to the glass. These, these elements would oxidize the iron, making the glass colorless. And in our data set, um, among the colorless glass samples, we find three different groups. The first one contains relatively high amounts of uh, manganese, which was deliberately added to make the glass colorless. So that are the manganese decolored glasses. A second group is the antimony decolored glass. These have um, high antimony concentrations, but no detectable manganese. And then a third group has intermediate concentrations of the two elements. They are essentially a mixture of the two. When we analyzed the, what we thought to be natural colored samples, with so the pale blue greenish, we didn't expect to find any of these decolorants in there. But the results show that they can have relatively wide manganese uh, concentrations, up to almost 2% of manganese oxide, which is very high. So uh, we interpret this as um, a signature that um, the manganese was indeed added deliberately in a failed attempt to make the glass colorless. So there must have been something wrong with the furnace conditions or the atmosphere uh, that resulted in a failure to make colorless glass. The major elements in glass are uh, silica, soda, calcium, and aluminium. And when we want to distinguish different composition groups, these would be the first elements to look at. So here we have a silica versus soda plot and an aluminium versus calcium plot. Uh, all the different colors of the glasses are plotted se separately, and also our three, uh, three colors glass groups are uh, depicted with different uh, symbols. And we can see that the, man the antimony decolored glasses group very nicely together, both in the silica soda plot and also in the aluminium calcium plot. This suggests that they were uh, made with a different sand source containing less amounts of uh, calcium, so less shell or limestone, and also less aluminium, so less feldspar in the sand. But also a different uh, recipe, because the uh, silica over uh, soda ratio indicates that um, these glasses were produced with a higher natron over sand ratio. The other glasses, the uh, manganese decolored, pale colored and strongly colored glasses cannot be distinguished further based on these elements. Uh, they appear to have, be it a little bit broad, but quite a similar base glass composition. But when we look at the mixed decolorized glasses, so the, what, the one that both contain antimony and manganese, we can see that the base glass composition of those glasses lies in between our major group and the ones decolorized by antimony. Um, so next to their intermediate concentrations of antimony and manganese, they also have intermediate concentrations of calcium and aluminum. This suggests that these are actually the result of recycling during which uh, the manganese and antimony decolorized glasses were remelted together. But how can we determine where these glasses actually were made? We clearly see two different groups, our major group with all the colored glasses and the manganese decolored glass, and the antimony decolored group. Maybe we can get more information from isotopic composition. And in glass studies, especially the radiogenic isotopes of strontium and neodymium are of interest. 
Francium belongs to the alkaline earth group of the periodic table and has very similar uh, geochemical properties as calcium. So the strontium in our natron gas is mostly coming in with the source of lime. So the isotopic signature of strontium in the glass will reflect the origin of the lime. Neodymium is a rare earth element belonging to the lanthanide series, and neodymium in natron glass is mainly coming in with the non-quartz mineral fraction of the sand raw material. And the neodymium isotopic composition in the glass will hence be a reflection of the source of the silicon. So we analyzed the selection of our glasses for strontium and neodymium isotopes. Uh, here we have the strontium isotope ratio on the horizontal axis and the epsilon neodymium value, which uh, Esther has already explained in the uh, previous part of the session, on the vertical axis. And these, this data actually confirms the different primary origin of our major glass group and the antimony colored glasses. Our bulk samples all have relatively homogeneous epsilon neodymium values between minus 5 and minus 4, while the antimony colored glasses have lower epsilon neodymium values. These glasses also have a very homogeneous strontium isotopic signature, which is close to the modern-day seawater signature, indicated here in blue, and this suggests that strontium, and hence the calcium, is coming in with a shell material, probably uh, naturally occurring in the beach sands as a silicon The strontium isotopic signature in the other glasses appear to be much more varied. We might interpret this as uh, a saying that there was a variety of different uh, lime bearing material in the sand. But when we take the manganese concentration in these glasses into account, we actually get a different story. Here we see the strontium isotopic signature. Uh, plotted against the concentration of manganese in the glasses. And for glasses which contain hardly any manganese, the strontium isotopic signature is actually very close to that of the modern day seawater. Glasses with a lot of manganese have very low, well, much lower isotope ratios. There's a clear inverse correlation between the two. And this suggests or indicates that the uh, manganese bearing ore manganese bearing minerals that were added to the glass to make the glass colorless actually brought in quite a lot of strontium with relatively low non-radiogenic uh, isotopic signatures. The strontium isotope ratios in the, press, in the pristine glass, so before being decolored, would have been very close to the seawater value and hence would again indicate the use of beach sands for their production. So when using isotopes in glass, or I guess in, in all uh, materials and artifacts, we also have to be aware with what raw material that the elements in question are coming in. Uh, it's very often the case that you have a mixture of different signatures. Um, then we wanted to see whether these glasses could have been produced locally. So all glass fragments came from Beirut in Lebanon. And to see whether they could have been made locally or not, we wanted to compare them to locally available sand raw materials. To do that, we collected um, 39 sand samples from 17 beaches all along the coast of Lebanon. And we analyzed them uh, with optical emission spectroscopy to get, to get their uh, major elemental composition. To compare the composition of the sands to those of the glasses, we calculated the concentrations of all elements in hypothetical glasses that could have been uh, prepared with these sands. And then we get plots like this. So in these plots, we see the expected concentrations of silica, calcium, aluminium, and iron in hypothetical glasses that can be made from our sands. So when we raise the soda content to the average content of soda we find in our um, glasses from neighbors. The gray boxes here correspond to the compositional ranges we find in our major composition group from Beirut. So actually the actual ranges we see in the glass. And we look, when we look at these data, we can at first glance see that in the, oh yes, um, the data are represented here from north to south along the coastline. 
Uh, when we look at the data, we can see that in the north part, and in the southern part, the hypothetical grasses would be very rich in calcium. And this corresponds nicely with the geology. Uh, both the northern and southern part of uh, Lebanon are dominated by limestones. So the beach sands there are almost exclusively composed of limestone fragments. Uh, so they would not produce a good glass. But from about here to there, in the area around Beirut, we can see that the silica contents are relatively good. They correspond more or less to the values we find in the glass. And also the calcium is pretty decent. Um, however, in this part, the iron is much too high, which is a problem. Because if you would melt the sand with very high iron, your glass would go black, which is not always wanted. And our major problem is actually in the aluminium. When we compare our concentrations in the calculated glasses from the sands to the range we actually find, we can see that our sands are very low in aluminium compared to the glasses. So, although I have uh, no doubt that these sands can actually be molten into a glass. They would produce quite a decent glass. These compositions would not correspond to the glasses we actually find in Beirut. So we have to conclude that the glasses in Beirut were probably not made locally. Um, we also looked at the strontium and neodymium isotopes in these sands. And um, well, it's not very, good vi very visible, but here we plotted them against uh, our data from the glasses, and we only used the signatures from the uh, good glass making sands. And there's one or two which plot in between our data. So when we would only have looked at the isotopes, we would have concluded that it is highly likely that the Beirut glass was produced locally. However, the composition of the, of the sands contradicts that. So our conclusion is. Look at all your data before drawing conclusions. Thank you.